Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of the Known and Never podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Bromley, and this week we are looking back at a disappointing point at home to an on-the-beach Brighton, where the Clarets once again, for the umpteenth time this season, pressed that self-destruct button and found yet another ludicrous way to lose a football game. Time is running out for the Clarets, and in the last week we have thrown away two very good chances to get two good wins on the board Almost certain now that the Clouts will be relegated to the Championship. I'm joined this week by regular panellist Tom Whitaker. He'll be going over that game at Turf Moor and wondering what's next for this Burnley side. So, without further ado, let's go. Tom, how are we? Oh, I'm not so bad, not so bad. Uh, yeah. A bit worse after that intro, to be honest. It was a bit depressing, but... Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, I was in the green room listening as well. I was recording that. and I didn't intend to be that down in the dumps about it, to be honest, because, you know, there's a, there's a, there are some things to be positive about about the club. I think if you write this season off as being a bit of a difficult season, um, we've got investment, and yes, we know it's a succession plan. Um, we know that it's based on success, but we've got some investment there we've got owners who want to who are ambitious and want to do some things we are going to do well in the championship next season we've got a club that consider themselves to be a premier league side who have had to drop down a division whereas for many years we were considered to be a a championship side batting above our station essentially so there are some general things to look forward to it's just it's very difficult this season to not get bogged down in in the detail of, of a very miserable season um Tom, another key game at Turf Moor, another must-win game and another opportunity to try and get some of those points reduced and get the deficit club back. And the Clarets once again failed to take it. At this point, I, I, I just I can't believe that we're finding more creative ways to just shoot ourselves in the foot here. Yeah, I think uh, addressing the sort of key game thing first, it didn't really have that feel to me. Uh, I think. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, in not in the grounds, you know, it felt for the Wolves one. You know, after we we've got the, the win against Brentford, we got a good point against Chelsea. It felt like there was a bit of oh, you know, if we win this, we yeah. can do something there in the Wolves. But I didn't go to the Everton game, but obviously that was a bad result, and it felt to me like most people had given up at that point because it, yeah. it didn't feel like there was much anticipation in the build up to me for the Brighton game. It was one that you thought we might get something out of, but it didn't feel to me like everyone was thinking, win this and we're back in with a shout kind of thing. I think people are kind of throwing in the towel now. Um, and it, to be honest, on the pitch, didn't have that feel either, did it? You know, first half, I think we were no, the No, that's fair. Um, missed two great chances in the first half, but, you know, mm. the, the second half was not, it was a complete non-event, really. We've got a lucky goal, or is it? I mean, not lucky in the sense that Brown Hill's worked hard, he's, he's close to keep it down and he's taken advantage of the mistake, but uh, yeah, as you say, uh, from that kind of position, you think it's one of those games where nothing's happened, and and, and as at Everton last week, you know, a, a kind of freak goal is going to settle it, and then we we give it a bit of anything you can do, we can do better, and decide to kick one in our own net under no pressure whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, I think it was one of those when we did score that goal. Like you say, there was a it was very fortuitous, you know, there was, a, there was a good deal of luck involved in them. But as you rightly say, credit has to go to Brownhill then. He, he got brought on to do a job. His fresh legs certainly seemed to do a difference. And it was his closing down of, of that defence and pressing that ball and tr- that forced the keeper into making a clearance that was nowhere near on, to say the least. And it bounds back off him and goes in the back of the net. And at that point, I, I'd said to my dad, like, it feels really nice to finally be on the right side of that to be the ones that are benefiting from a bit of a lucky lucky twist and then just I I had my head in my face in my hands for like a good 10 seconds when the goal went in and it went I just couldn't believe what I'd seen that at this level considering that we have footballers that are supposed to be at the peak of their game playing in a highly competitive league in a season where points or everything would just lose their concentration to that extent I mean it's a mistake of course it is but is that is it fair to say that that to me amplifies some of those key values that are missing that discipline that 
concentration, that commitment to making sure that every, you know, you don't do it. I see it so much, Tom, across the pitch. Lazy passes that don't quite hit the man. Somebody just like toe poking it instead of putting the foot through it. And like you say, just that decision making from Murich for the equal for the equaliser was just shocking. And for me, that's it's it's just not there in this side. I don't know if it's the decision making necessarily. I mean, it's Burns maybe holds on to it a bit too long. We have got this tendency to go backwards and sideways when we could be looking to go forward and, and that's that was the same at 1-1 one, one. you know we weren't trying to score a second goal it, or it didn't feel like like that anyway but um, it, I think you know people have overanalyzed this and, and I, you know I was saying to me that maybe she'd put that back pass between you know to the side as opposed to between the posts that's the sort of golden rule that you get told but at the end of the day it's just rubbish football from your age. like I don't think you can put it down you know Bellamy's saying oh it's it's all our faults that's the way we're told to play it's nothing like that to me. It's just like you said. It's just a lack of concentration. It's just a mistake. I don't think it's something that you put down to um, put down to uh, the, the way we play or anything like that. I think any team in the world could, could play a gentle back pass to the keeper in that position. And but I suppose you're expecting to maybe who fill up the pitch as opposed to having a torch. But I think I think there's a I think you can overanalyze that a bit too much and say oh it reflects this and that of our season. Basically, it's just a, a complete brain fart. And it's one of them, as you said, mistakes all over the pitch on, on Saturday. If if Brun Larson hits the target from two yards out, if Fafana doesn't miss another open goal. Yeah. If it, two he or three. Was bad. He was bad um, on Saturday. Yeah, he was he was really poor. And, you know, there's, he wasn't the only one. So it's one of them, uh, when you're a keeper, you know, if you have a bad touch when you're a keeper, it's a goal. And if you're a midfielder and you do that, you know, nine times out of ten, it's not going to lead to anything. So I think I don't think it's necessarily all. Uh, it's the way we play for that. Um, yeah. it, it, it's just bad. It's just just a bad bit of football from Jurich, and it's and it's cost us. Um, I suppose it, it's amplified a bit by the fact that that's the second game in a row where he's made a mistake and it's cost us points. I'm sure we'll get onto the kind of the goalkeeping debate on here, but uh, yeah, to me that's that's not any. That's not kind of indicative of the wider problems we've had this season necessarily. I think sometimes we've we've had problems where it's been players who aren't good enough to play this kind of football. I'm thinking of maybe Brown who's red card against Crystal Palace. Mm. Uh, I'm thinking of the bad the bad pass against Wolves away where O'Shea's played it short and Burge gets caught. Um, but I don't think there's any. I don't think it's necessarily that. I think that's perhaps what most teams would do in that situation is pass it back, and it's it's just a bit of a, a head loss from Norwich. So. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to feel about that, really. Yeah, well, I guess it brings us on to, to the next question. I mean, we'd, we'd been screaming at the top of our lungs for Murich to get brought in again instead of Trafford all season. And it was obvious to everybody other than company, seemingly, that Trafford was struggling um, and a lot of our problems this season had been down to um, some vulnerability at the back. Irrespective of two bad goals to concede over the space of two games, I still start with Murich in the next of the next game. I don't for Sheffield Sheff Wednesday, Sheff United. I don't I don't change him. I don't know how you feel about that, Tom. I'm kind of ambivalent really, to be honest. Um, oh. <laughs> oh <dear. laughs> no, no, I don't mean that in, in the sense of I, I don't care. I just mean basically I could see either side like I think we look a better team with Murich in goal. Like yeah. he is, he is obviously better at what we want to do, which is pass the ball out. Um, you know, he's better with his feet, albeit the fact that him using his feet has cost us in the last two games. Um, I think if you'd have had sort of twenty-eight games and made two mistakes, then it, you know it's maybe a little bit more kind of diluted, if that makes sense. But also equally, I think when you're making mistakes of that capacity, of that kind of magnitude, and as I say, it's not. I don't think he can hide behind. Oh, it's the way we play and. And you know, Bellamy saying, "Oh, it's not. It's our mistake, not his mistake." I, I'm not. I don't believe that for a second. I think you could probably actually say that more about Trafford. If, you know, thinking about the the Brown one at Palace, for example, where Trafford plays the ball short. I think when you're being asked to do something that you clearly can't do, that is probably more when you say it's the it's not his fault necessarily. Yeah. Murich can trap that. You know, we know he's good with his feet, and he's just. Well, who knows what he's doing? Not not concentrating enough. I think he probably is a bit too laid back sometimes. Um, I, and I I remember the Watford home game last year. He made he made a complete rick. He had a shocking first half. He got popped at half time, 
company was saying afterwards he was ill. I think he was protecting him a bit. Oh, personally. yeah, I do remember that. And, yeah, and, and it didn't surprise me when we looked to bring in a, a keeper in the summer. The problem that we've we've had is obviously the, the guy that we brought in isn't as good as Murich, which, well, and it's not to yet. say Murich is perfect. Yet. Yet. Yeah, yeah. It will be better than Murich, Will Trafford. I'm, I'm sure of it. I It'll think there's be a better talent at there. Some things. Yeah, I don't think he's ever going to be as good as his feet. As Actually, to be fair, I'm not sure there's any other keeper that's as good as as Murich as we speak. <laughs> that that boy makes passes that he has no business as a goalkeeper making. I don't know how he finds them. He makes mm. passes better than some midfielders, but yeah, that's mm. fair. And, uh, yeah, but then at the same time, as I say, the the mistake that he's cost us like three points in the last two games. There's no there's no getting around that. There were his errors, and I, 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 as I said, I don't I don't I think you can hide behind which the way we play and and that. I no, think it's just that's fair. Deep that concentration and if we're a team that doesn't score many goals right we, obviously we didn't really get close to scoring at Everton we had one shot on target maybe on Saturday as I say it's, it's, it's not Murich's fault that Fafana and Brun Larson have missed sitters in the first half on Saturday but when you nick a goal out of nothing with sort of 10-15 minutes left in a really tight game and your keeper's doing that because you can't control the football properly then if, if company turned around the next game and said look you know you're making incredibly basic errors. You're supposed to be a Premier League goalkeeper. I'm going to give Trafford a go for the next one because as 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 much as the team looks worse with Trafford in it and as much as Trafford can't do some of the things that Murich can do, I don't think he's made any errors that are as bad as those two from Murich. No, no, he hasn't. Yeah, no, they're egregious. They there's, been a, there's been a few mistakes, that try, particularly around corners, uh, where he's, he's, he's directly led to a goal where Trafford's either flapped or he's just not imposed his area well enough or he's just um, he's just too fragile in um, against set pieces. But they're not individual howlers. They're just him not being fit for that particular part of his job. And some mm. of that's down to physicality. Some of it's down to experience. Some of it's down to height. It's just he's a young man that has he hasn't developed physically yet and he will do this. There's a good reason why keepers tend to get to their best qualities around 28 to 35. You know that they need to be, they need to have the physical presence. They need to develop fully, and they need to have that experience of seeing it all. And, and you know, Trafford's just not there yet. And to go from League One to face City at home in the Premier League was a a shocking piece of man management by Vincent Company, in my opinion. Um, okay, staying a little bit closer to Murich then. The other change that we saw at the weekend was the forced change um thankfully none of us had to watch Dar Roche on, on on Saturday which was uh you know no no disrespect to him I'm sure he's a lovely lovely football and I'm sure he'll be fantastic in the championship next season but I was I didn't miss him at Saturday it was an opportunity to see um Estev play with Ekdal which I think is another centre-half partnership that we've not seen this season and a quick side point to that Tom Part of our many problems in defence this season has been a lack of um, a, a consistent centre half pairing. Um, we've seen so many different variations across the whole of the back four this season, and it, that cannot be allowed to continue the next time we're in the Premier League. Um, but on the whole, a partnership that I very much enjoyed. I thought Ekdal was good. I thought he was solid. Um, I thought he played very well against Estev. Um, and they, I thought Charlotte Taylor was slightly off in bits, but I thought Asignon was much more improved. And we looked a bit stronger at the back. I don't know how you feel about this. Yeah, similar to the Wolves game again, I think there was a clear plan there to get the centre-halves up the pitch a lot, a lot more than they have been. Um, and they, they did it well. I thought Ekdal played well. To me, all our centre-halves, there's not a great deal between them. I've seen a lot of people really raving about it, Steph, and I think I think he'll be a good player, but to, to me, he's not massively better than Bayer, for example. I think he's got. I think a lot of them have got the same kind of flaws. Um, for me, Ekdal is a bit better than O'Shea, but companies obviously, as you say, decided that O'Shea is one of his starting centre halves. Um, I thought they played well, but I think a lot of it was to do with the way we set up. I think it was the same in the Wolves game, and I think O'Shea played well in the Wolves game because of what they were being asked to do, which is get up high, win it up high, and the team looked better for that as well. And it, I think that's probably part of our kind of evolution tactically. We we saw that at the start of the season. We were doing that against like Spurs and getting ripped to bits. Um, and then we've perhaps been a bit too passive in some games. So, uh, yeah, I think, I don't think it was necessarily the personnel because I don't think there's that much between Ekdal, O'Shea, Stev, to be honest. I think it was just the way we set up. Look, okay. made them good for me personally. 
Although I do think that Ekdal is probably a better player for me than O'Shea. Um, and then, but then you have the problem of you know Ekdal goes off after an hour of cramp because he's barely played, and then there was no centre halves on the bench. I don't. No. I mean, very bizarre situation. It feels to me, Tom, that we've got about sixty-five centre halves at the club, but we never have cover for any of them ever. Yeah, it was really weird what they did because, like, starting Bettino at left back and playing Taylor there, I don't. Uh, sorry, not playing Taylor there. I don't really understand that. I don't get why he does that. Then at half time, Bettino was fine. I don't think he was. He was bad in the first half. Then no, he gets up at half. Playing well. From the team. Don't understand why that was unless nope. Bettino had an injury. But then. Taylor's your only defensive cover on the bench. So then you make this change at half time that seems a little bit arbitrary and pointless. And then your centre half goes off. I mean, that, how he's not, how how can you not, if he's not fit enough to play more than an hour without cramping up, then surely you've got to have some cover on the bench for him. But it's this thing, I we've said it all season, players are just disappear into this black hole and you don't know, nope. they, they won't see if they're injured. I don't know if they're out of favour. It's like Bayer, he's been injured for months now. I guess I don't know. I, I don't. That's know still that is still an injury. I'm I'm led to believe is Bayer. That's quite yeah. a bad one. I don't think yeah. we'll see him again until we case, get to the start of the season. Know. Yeah. Um, but well, then, yeah, you're right. Del, where was Del Quire? I don't I don't know. Was he injured? Was he just not not fit? If so, why was he not he was fit? Terrible. But okay. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, as I say, I, I don't think there's much between them, the centre halves, and then Alder Keel as well. I think he's really struggled when he's played, so I kind of understand why he's been bombed out a bit. It's a bit like, uh, you know, Trezor. He, I mean, he reappeared, didn't he, on Saturday, but he disappeared for three months before that. But you can kind of understand that because when they played, not been good enough. But, uh, yeah, again, like you say, if you know that the centre-half he's playing, he's only fit enough to do an hour. And you must know, I mean, he hasn't played for months as he had now. He, he's been injured a lot of the season. So they must have at least a bit of an inkling yeah. that he ain't going to be able to do the 90 minutes. What are so, you doing? Why aren't you? Yeah, where, where where we I'd love to know, but it, and if you'd say in the press conferences, you know, before or after, you, you know, oh, here's an injury update. You know, Elder Keel's injured, Delphi's injured. We're down. You know, I, I was hearing about Luton saying, now oh, they've got all these centre halves out injured. Rob Edwards is saying oh, we're going to have to play so and so here and that. We don't get anything like that. No. And I don't really understand why. I don't know what no. purpose it's been. It's obviously not helping because we're not, we're having a crap season, but. I don't know. It was just something that annoyed me at the time, and it's annoyed me all season, to be honest. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you'd have kept Taylor on the bench, then at least you could have brought on Taylor to play centre half alongside Estev. But and and I don't think it helped that we. No, we ended, we ended up with Sandy Burge at one point. Did he end up filling in for? Yeah, was, yeah. Nice stuff. Square right. pegs and round holes has been a story of our season, and it's just I, I don't understand. I, to me, it feels like company just tinkers for the sake of it because it, that's what trendy managers and managers who know their squad very well can do when it's the pep way of doing things. And you just think, you, you haven't, for me, some of the criticisms, and I've given company a lot of space this season and a lot of time and a lot of goodwill to learn how to be a Premier League manager and to get this done properly. But some of the things that have frustrated me are his he hasn't earned the right to play some of the formations that he's playing or tinker around with the squad to the extent that he has because of his refusal to do the basics first properly. Like you these successful teams that can be have utility players that can play in lots of different places, that can have a squad rotation and everybody's ready. They do that because they've done the, the good stuff first. They've, they've laid the foundations. They've got the discipline. They've got an unbelievably solid understanding of where everybody plays and what the aim of the game is. And it feels to me that company has gone to step three without ever learning or implementing step one and two. And that it, that's why it crumbles. And that's why it doesn't make sense because we're trying to operate three steps ahead of where we're allowed to do. And it uh, where, sorry, where our technical ability allows us to. And it's just... There's just naivety everywhere, Tom. It drives me mad. So it's a good point you make there. Just when you were saying that, it just it just brought to mind last the documentary when you were saying about how the players need whatever is it, hundred not training sessions and whatever to learn the system. And like you say, we've played. I mean, I think the formation's been about the same the whole season, but the way we've played it's been different, definitely. Since Murich just came back in, the defence has 
four yards up the pitch again where it's came back from the edge of in and the like you said the personnel chops and changes so much the players are you know another good example of this kind of company roulette is Foster playing out on the right suddenly and then he's coming in an order playing playing up front what yeah and then but then on Saturday, Odebert's on the right. I thought he did quite well out on the right too. Uh, and as I say, again, Bryn Larson and Odebert, uh, Bryn Larson, sorry, and um, Fafana missing those two sitters, both from Odebert crosses. We should have had a penalty that Odebert would have won if uh, if VAR did sure. its job. But that... I, I, I've not seen any of that playback anywhere. It looks like a stone cold penalty to me from where I was sat. But I haven't, it, and none of the highlights that I've been able to watch back since has anybody showing it. It was on match today. Uh, I was mean, it? The, I don't know. I didn't watch much the guy comes, He kind of, I, could, I, I guess I could see why they didn't give it, but he comes across from the right. It's a really clumsy challenge. He's trying to sort of knock him off the ball, but he, he catches his leg and then the follow through, the ball bounces off the defender's other leg. And it's a clumsy challenge. He's lucky to get away with it. And I think if they'd have given it, they wouldn't have overturned it on the AR. But, uh, but yeah, anyway, so what yes, the point I was making, sorry, yeah. Odd a bit, was having a good first half. And then the second half, he goes back through the middle and Foster goes out on the right. And Foster does nothing the whole second half. And he's clearly not fit either. You know, no, when I mean, he's playing out of position, he can hardly run. And then the sub, the sub ball goes up and it's Fafana coming off. And like, I, I just don't understand. I genuinely don't know what the thought process is there. I'd love to know again. You don't hear about any of these kind of things in the press conferences, but it was just bizarre. And you've got Benson sat on the bench, you know, I don't know if he's run over the company's cat or something. You know, it's like, oh, the company doesn't think he's good enough for the Premier League. It, it, but sh- surely you give him more of a chance than he's had. I mean, you know, I've, even some of the games where he has had like five minutes, remember Man United, he come on and he's cu- he's doing the Benson move, which is to cut inside and hit it on your left foot. We know what he's going to do every time. I'd have bit tried it once or twice in the first half, didn't get anywhere with it. But at least when you do that, you know, something's going to happen. He did it against Wolves as well. He came on and, and put that ball in. I think it, we got a corner from it. I just, when you're getting nothing from Foster, nothing whatsoever, because he's not playing That's his right position. Yeah. Why, why would he not be a better option? It's just, uh, it's frustrating. It's really frustrating. And that, yeah. yeah it's, it feels like I'll, every single week we're asking these questions and it's then yeah. just rinse and repeat. It drives me insane. Yeah, and then he, he gives answers in the press conference like, "Oh no, Foster's been playing there the whole season," and, and you think, I'm that, not I saw your I saw your tweet about that actually, and I was gonna I was gonna ask you about this when we, when we're talking about it. I mean, as you put in your tweet, that's just demonstrably wrong. Like, do you think we are stupid? Like, at what point do you not think that we're gonna like? At what point do you think we're gonna turn on you and go, "What are you talking about? We have got our own eyes." You know, you don't fine we're not as qualified as you are in terms of coaching but we all watch a lot of football and we have done our entire lives we know full well when somebody's playing out on the wing or not and Foster has not been playing in that position this season like what are you talking about man yeah uh, yeah and he and, and then you think like is he is he just lying or does he actually think that and then you, you think if he actually thinks that then that's quite scary that's more worrying. Like, yeah yeah <laughs> this has been a lot of my frustration this season is this, the, you, you, the stuff you've seen you just think why it's so obvious and you can't see it and yeah you know. i mean i'm at this stage of the season now I, I spoke when we were on the analysis show a couple of weeks ago with rich um and i'd kind of got to the end of my tether with this and one of the things that i've been critical of over the past few weeks is this idea that oh it's a five-year plan and we got you know we got promoted ahead of schedule you've got to give them time and fine i've bought into that i understand it but i've, I've also been challenging that on the grounds that if you make wholesale changes at the end of each season, then you're not in a five-year plan. You're in a perennial cycle of a brand new squad that need time to gel together in these 100 training sessions and we're never going to improve. But I just feel like this season there have been so many bad decisions. The recruitment's been so bad. The, the play's been bad. From the manager downwards, it's just been wrong decision after wrong decision that I'm actually going full circle now, Tom, and I just feel like we just need to start again. We need to... We need to pretend that this is two years ago and we need to just start like we did when we got relegated under the Di- and it marked the end of the Daesh era. There's so much at the club that I just want out. Um, I have no idea where the likes, uh, well, I think I think uh, Connor Roberts is going to be gone. I think he's burnt his bridges with him, but like Zorori and Benson and um, Twine, and like these players who were integral to our championships, and like, is there a role for them? Do they come back? Some of these players like Sander Burge, Foster, Amdunia, they're not going to hang around in the championship. They're going to go. Like, there are 
there is an uncertainty to the, to the start of next season in the Championship where we don't know the players we would maybe want to keep are not going to be here. But we've got an awful lot of dead wood that I would just be happy to clear out, Tom. I mean, are there any obvious players who... OK, let's not do this this way. Let's not call out players and say, get rid. That sounds mean. Who, who do you consider in the current squad our golden eggs that you would want to keep to start again, to build the foundations of the squad? I'm starting off by saying I think both keepers are integral to that. I think we keep Trafford and Murich. It's really difficult, isn't it? Because the financial position that we're in now, we've, we've spent so much in the summer on... Right. A, load of, a load of rubbish, basically. Uh, players, the majority of the players that we signed have not appreciated in value, I think it's fair to say, this season. That's wonderfully well put. You should be a politician, Tom Whitaker. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we've overspent on... I think we overspent on Trafford. I think we've overspent on Trezor, for sure. We probably, oh, yeah. I don't think we're going to make our money back on Amdouni. We ain't going to make our money back on Ramsey. And it's, it puts us in a really difficult position. I'd forgotten I think, all about Ramsey. Yeah, Clean, I've forgotten it. He existed. Well, We've got so many players, haven't we? You think how many we've got out on loan? We're going to have a good... It's like 40, 50 players we've got in the first team squad when they all come back. So mm. you're going to have to cut loads of them out. We're going to have to At sell least a lot. half that think, squad's going to have to go. Yeah. And then you think, and does he want to bring more in? I think it, knowing that we're going to have to sell in order to, to you know, finance next season, the, you, you'd hope what we can do is is sell off enough fringe players that we can be kind of reasonably okay financially. So you'd be looking at people, and I know you said not to name names, and when I say the, when I throw some of these names out, I, this isn't to be. No, fr- it's all right to say yeah. f- the fringe players that aren't part of this, that, that's fine. I just yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah, don't yeah. want to pile on players who are already good. Yeah. But yeah, fringe yeah. players, like, they're fine. Name those. People like McNally, for example, who we spent a bit of money on. He's, yeah. he's not got near the first team. There's about six players ahead of him in the squad. Yeah. We could maybe make our money back on him. He's been playing in the championship the next couple last couple of years. Egan Riley, you know, is he going to get a chance? I wouldn't have thought so. No, he can. Twine, the people like Twine. I'd bring Twine back. Fun. Actually, I would bring yeah. Twine back. I think he's I like easy. Twine. I do. Um, Obafemi, he can. I think he's a fringe yeah. player. Can go. Well, the the people that I'm thinking of now are the people who, as soon as we've gone up to the prem, they've been immediately replaced, and you think that's because company doesn't rate them. Rate them. But then it's like, but then do you are you thinking for to build a squad for the Premier League or are you thinking let's just get out of the league because if you were thinking let's get out of the league then you'd want Zorri and Benson in there wouldn't you because they yeah. they were brilliant in the champ last season but then we're going to have to sell somebody and then like I've gone way off your original question no 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 please go this is great this is great go but you'd be thinking people like Burge wouldn't you you'd be I think he's he'd going. Be the first he'll absolutely go I would yeah. love to keep him for next season Burge. We will. I'd love to he's, he's number one on my list but there's no way yeah. we keep him I think Odebert I think Collio Show um, you don't think that... we'll keep those I think we'll keep Odebert and Collio Show well I'm saying these are the people that I'd like to keep oh sorry okay the trouble should... we've got is we need to sell someone and then the people that are most likely to be sold are the ones that other teams will want and the teams that other people will want are the ones that we want to keep if that makes sense okay so, Amdouni we could well, probably I, I, I get rid of him I can't see Amdouni sticking around in the championship nope. I can't, I can't see, see Foster sticking around Foster won't um, I know though because Foster and through no fault of his own he's obviously he's had a very stop start season and he looked really really good at the start of the season didn't he he looked he, amazing he did a brilliant job with him because when we signed him in January you were thinking what the hell have we spent our money on here but he, he looked fantastic at the start of the Premier League season um, and then he's had a couple of injuries he's obviously had the, the enforced time out with his mental health issues and I'd, I'd, since the Villa game away, Villa away he looked brilliant there And but this calendar year he's looked really poor to me to be honest and again I can't see a Premier League team coming in for him Um. I can't, a lot of these players I can't see Premier League teams coming in for, to be honest. Uh, but the ones that I can are the ones that I'd like to keep. So, Birch, uh, um, Odebert, Collio Show. Um, <laughs> start, start to run a bit dry after that. Um, yeah. But then, because I think if you want to actually make any money on transfers, there are you going to have to sell. I think they're the teams that, that are going to get big bids. Yeah. And the only other way Pulling around. Pulling we keep. Sell. Pulling we keep, I think. Yeah, I can't see any Premier League team coming in for Colin. Isn't the only other way around it? If you want to make 
let's share. I mean, what, I think it was 70 million we made when we came down last time. We ain't going to do that again because the, the squad's not as good. But let's say let's say we aim to make like 30 million. Let's say I'm just you know yeah. I don't know what it'll actually be, but if you can sell ten sort of squad players, let's say you get three mil for Abafemi, three mil for Twine, mm. etc. You could pro- probably have got ten of them that you could shift on and make thirty. That's million a really good way. point, actually. Mm. And and we do, what that's what we really need to do is trim the squad down. I think so. Like we need, you know, how many wings we've got? Eight or nine or whatever like it is. Fifty six, I think. Something yeah. like that. <laughs> so, or Belgian. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> and what do we need really I, I think probably good is going to go um at the end of the season um so Cork will go i suspect yeah. i think yeah, we'll I keep think. charlie taylor for one more season I'd, I'd like to but i don't know if he's a company player that's an, that's another thing but again, no but it, it, but the professionalism of this guy to do what he's done this season i think is earned. if somebody else comes in for him and he'd rather go then i think we let him go because i think that that man for what he's done for us this season has written a blank check to get whatever he wants next season if he wants to stay with us another year sign him if he wants to go somewhere else let him go because he has been a, a profound professional for us this season um i think jack cork uh jay probably have had the, like the old guard have now had their time uh brown Hill will stay i think he's a great player in the championships so i think he will stay i think we'll start well i think our center half partnership next season will be cullen and, and brown Hill again um, I'm concerned that we don't have a third with Sander Burge more than likely to go um, but yeah it all just feels very meh doesn't it so okay it's, it's really hard to know what kind of team we're going to have next season I think and we'll go back into the loan to... market again won't we yeah it would make sense wouldn't it but I'm hoping this, this summer we're not going to bring in sort of 10, 15 players like we have done the last two years because what we really need is to get rid of them and we need to develop the ones we've got like you said um, before about, you know, you come up and replace the whole team. If we'd have kept that team together and developed it, I think even if we'd have gone down, one, I don't think we'd necessarily have gone down as badly as we have done. But similar to when we came up the first time with Dyche, you know, we came back down, but we kept that team together yeah. and there were some really good players in there. Obviously, England and Trippier left, but we replaced them well, I think. And the majority of the team we had, then we came back up and, you know, you got me, Heat. Kept them for a decade, for the best part of a decade in the end. Yeah, yeah. we don't Very have that spine and we don't have that that relationship with the, the on the field to the fans either and that helps really does help so you know I, I keep we keep trying to make this message to the board it's not about flags it's not about drummers or creating fake atmosphere the, there's a fundamental way that you keep your fans on board and some of that's results orientated there's nothing you can do about that but a lot of it is a connection to the pitch. And if we're turning into a club that has to sell every summer and there's going to be a high turnover of players because that's the business model that a side like Burnley has to, to do to survive in the Premier League, then you're going to have to find a way to connect with your fans because that's not what we're used to and that's not how us as a community club operate or have operated over the years. So, yeah, that'll be an interesting one. Good. Um, any final thoughts before we wrap up this week then, Tom? How are you feeling generally? Yeah, I would say um, I was, uh, you know, I've been called quite <laughs> quite negative quite a lot of the season. I don't necessarily think I've been wrong in a lot of the things that I've said. Um, I think I've been realistic, but perhaps I'm guilty of being a bit negative. But for me, I came off the Brighton game feeling relatively positive, actually, about next season. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I think, we've, I think we're a much better team than we were. You know, the first half of the season, we were, sort of, we were genuinely awful. Then we had a bit of a renaissance. And then it, the Palace and the Arsenal games were some of the worst I've seen. And, I, and at that point, I was just like, oh, my God, I can't yeah. stand watching this anymore. But the last, since, especially since you brought Murich back in, but even the couple of games before that, we look, we're competing at least. We, look, we don't look like a team who's completely out of our depth anymore like we did at the start yeah. of the season. So I think the signs that there's a bit of evolution, um, the, some of the players have improved. I know we had a pop at O'Shea, but... Uh, I think he has improved from from where we started. I think there's been improvement in players like Trafford as well. Um, as you know, as much as he's not in the team now, um, Odebert I think has improved. So I think there's positive signs. I think especially in the first half we looked a good side. You know, we're still a long way off. We still can't put a 90 minute performance together. I still think the manager there's big question marks there, and I'm in the top. It'll be good yes. in the championship. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 So. There's still, I, I wouldn't say like everything's rosy and I'm I'm thinking we're going to walk the league again next season, but 
the last few weeks made me a lot more positive than I was. Same. And I've just enjoyed going the last few weeks. Oh, good. And I don't go to every game thinking how many we're going to lose by today kind of thing, which is a big improvement. So, yeah, I wanted to end on a on a, a positive note at least. I, I love think it. Very low, but uh, yeah, I, well I have felt a bit better than the last few weeks. Well, that, that is where we're going to end this week's podcast. And this is your homework for this week, listeners. We want a petition going to basically say that the number one aim for Vincent Company and his team next season is to cheer Tom Claret up because he has been miserable all season. And the lad loves his football and we can't have him another season down in the dumps like we are. So a good ending, Tom. Thank you as ever for coming on and sharing your thoughts this week's po- with this week's positive message and this week's podcast. My thanks also go to everybody else who has contributed to making this episode possible, to producer Matt, to Statman Dave, and to the rest of the Known and Ever panel for their contribution throughout the week behind the scenes that get us our material delivered to you. Please don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube. Also turn on notifications to get alerted to new shows. And you can find us on the podcast via your usual podcast provider. We'll be back the weekend on Friday night with the preview show. Um, For all of our Clarets travelling to Chef United on Saturday, my goodness, chapeau to you all. That's some commitment. Um, Keep an eye out for socials for any news coming out of the team. But in the meantime, we'll be back to you on Friday. I've been Natalie Bromley. This has been the Known and Ever podcast. Until next time. The Known and Ever podcast is brought to you in association with the TalkSport Fan Network. Our host and editor is Natalie Bromley and the show is produced by Matt Moss. Our resident statistician is Dave Roberts and our FPL expert is Adam Dennett. The analysis show team is collectively Tom Whitaker, Rich Steele, George Poole, Charlotte Rigby and Adam Dennett. Our music is provided by George Gaskell and our newsletter team is headed up by Jamie Smith. If you don't already, you can subscribe to our newsletter by visiting nonenever.substack.com. Thanks as ever go to our partners, TalkSport. We are proud to be associated with the TalkSport fan network.